chapter 15, verses 29 through 34. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all? Why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. This is the reading of the Word of God. God. So we're going to go over three points, and they are, The resurrection gives us boldness to risk. Number two, the resurrection gives us motivation to sacrifice. The third one, the resurrection gives us purpose to live. Now, I love this topic that Pastor Pete has begun, and it's on the new life. And I believe that the new life begins here that the resurrection really played a key role in the life of the Apostle Paul. The resurrection was the main point of Paul's preaching, his service, and his very life. That it had practical implications for the Apostle Paul, and so it does for us today. That the way that you and I live today has everything to do with this. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, he says, and our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. In verse 15, he says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God. In verse 17, it says that your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins if Christ has not been raised. Now, if we deny the resurrection, we deny everything about the Christian faith, because the resurrection is essential to our belief. That the Christian faith hinges upon the Christian belief that says that Christ rose. And really, that this is a non-negotiable doctrine. And this is why the Apostle Paul spends so much time on this. That they must hold on to this resurrection, or else they believed in vain. Our belief in the resurrection dictates everything about us. That if the resurrection hasn't occurred, then our faith and our living is pointless. That this will determine how you and I will live our life. Because the resurrection, it drives us, it transforms us, it motivates to live God-honoring lives. That do you know what made the New Testament apostles give themselves over to death? to sacrifice and obedience. It's really the hope of the resurrection. Look in verse 29. Our first point is the resurrection gives us boldness to risk. It says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Now, There are many interpretations to this specific passage, but a commentator gives a pretty reasonable um, comment on this, and he says, they which are baptized refers to living believers who give outward testimony to their faith in baptism by water because they are first drawn to Christ by the faithful influence and witness of believers who subsequently died. Paul's point is that if there is no resurrection and no life after death, then why are people coming to Christ to follow the hope of those who have died? So why would others get baptized if there is no resurrection? That believers got baptized because they did believe. And so as Paul continues in verse 30, he says, so 
why are we in danger every hour? Now, Paul essentially says, if there's no resurrection, if that Jesus hasn't rose, then why would we put ourselves at the edge of death every day? That there was a, a cause and a purpose why Paul risked his own life. That it took, that take a look at the early church and their life and how dangerous as they preached and as they were threatened when they preached the gospel, how many were hostile to it. And really, as the resurrection gives us a present confidence to risk our lives, why? Because the resurrection is true. That we come here, that will we give our life away for this Christ? That will we risk our lives or will we waste our lives? That the apostles, as they expose, expose themselves to danger every single day, as it says that they, they continually put themselves at the verge of death, that they constantly lived their life in jeopardy, that they obeyed Christ even when it costed them their own life, that they put themselves in dangerous situations because of the furthering of the gospel. Now, why would the apostles place themselves in such situations, in threatening conditions, if the resurrection isn't true? That why would they put their physical bodies through all the harsh environments if there's no more than this life? He says here that the early church was, was, was willing to risk everything because of the future reward. And why do athletes put themselves under such hard conditions that they endure hardships in the moment, challenges? It's because of the hope of winning the Olympics. And yet, they are not for sure. Yet for us, we can be sure of this hope that you and I have in God. That what gives you and I the present endurance in our suffering is that we have eternal life. That if you and I don't believe in the resurrection, we will seek to preserve this very life and have nothing to look forward to. The belief in the resurrection will cause one to risk his own life because death is not the end for the believer. That if the resurrection is true, it should result in the forsaking of all our earthly comforts and risk ourselves for the cause of the cross. That there's a cost to be paid when in lived in light of the resurrection. That living in light of the resurrection may cost a dream of ours to collapse. Maybe a plan. It could be a, a hope, a desire of ours. It's about holding all things loosely and entrusting all things to the providence of God. Knowing that everything that you and I lose for the cause of the cross, it's only a gain for us that we ultimately don't end up losing, but gaining in the losing of our comforts and risking our lives here. And our second point is that the, direct, the resurrection gives us motivation to sacrifice. He says, I protest brothers by my pride in you. He says here in the NLT, he says, for I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily that Paul is swearing by the pride that he has in them in Christ. The pride that Paul has in them is what the Lord has done in them, that he was proud of the saving work of Christ in their lives, even though they were a hot mess, of what the Lord has accomplished in them, and not necessarily what they have done. That this boasting exists in Christ, that Christ is a reason why he's able to boast here, that he says, I die daily. That he faces the reality of death every moment. That Paul lived every single day expecting death, and he was ready for it. 
Death as though was, was his companion, his friend. It was so present to him that he walked in the expectation of it. That Paul reserved his life, not for himself, but completely for God. That there was no day that Paul kept for himself. That he says, I die every day. Saying that, that Paul viewed his life wholly to God. There's no aspect that he kept to himself. And that this is a personal statement that he says here. He says, I die daily. That he speaks of himself personally. What he's saying is that I, I forsook the world. I turned my back on it. I no longer live for it. That whatever comes my way, if that be hate, persecution, mockery, being falsely accused, he says, I endure it. Now, we may ask, what made Paul preserve or persevere through it all? What made him not grow weary and tired nor depressed in a place where he's not willing to get back up? And really, there's a secret. In Romans 8, 18, it says here, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That what is the point of this all? That Paul says that I'm willing to suffer everything because of what is awaiting for me. The prize that he gets to be with the Lord who loves him and cares for him. That he's saying that I'm willing to endure all these things because this here is not over. And so he's willing to risk everything and willing to die every day because of the hope and of the confidence that he has in God. Here in verse 32, he says, What do I gain if humanly speaking? He says, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. He says, what is the point of enduring to fight in this life if there's no resurrection? You know, to what advantage does Paul have? If there's no resurrection, then he's just a fool. If the dead aren't raised, it's profitless for him to suffer and to endure everything. Right? That from a human standpoint, what would it profit Paul to go through it all, to put his life at stake? If his motivation wasn't driven because of the resurrected Christ, then why would he live at the verge of death? that really his life reflected something about who Christ is and what he's done. That his present life reflected an, an eternal reality to him. That this is the way that he lived. That every single moment that he believed deep down inside his soul, in his heart, that Christ really rose. That Paul's life wasn't about gaining this world. It's really about experiencing Christ and knowing Him. Do you see why this is so important? This how affects one and how one lives. And as he says here that, that in verse 32, what do I gain if humanly speaking I fought with beasts at Ephesus? This can be taken literally or figuratively. Although we have no place in, in the Bible where Paul is fighting a beast. But really, it can be taken figuratively when pointing to his uh, violent human opponents faced in Ephesus and Acts. But really, as Paul continues to share his fights and his battles, willing to risk everything because of the resurrection, and in 32, he says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He says, if there's no resurrection, there's no future judgment. And if there's no future judgment, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die anyways. We would just be as though as just beasts. And really, the implication here is that if there's no resurrection, then let us just indulge in this life. Because this is all that we have then. If there's nothing more than here, then, and if this is all of our hopes confined to this world, he says there's, there's nothing else to look forward then to. 
that all that we have been given, everything, it's really as to make us see Him. That you end up living your life, seeking to preserve your own life, to live in such a way that fulfills the lust of the flesh, that it makes it all about me and what I want, what I desire, because there's no resurrection then. That you become obsessed with yourself, and we find this in our culture. In our culture, we have statements such as, love yourself, when Jesus says, forsake yourself. The coach says, focus on yourself, while Jesus says, focus upon me. That we would have our eyes upon him. And really, a denial of the resurrection leads to a wasted life. Because nothing else matters but what we do now. And, and the indulgement of an obsession with ourselves. So what he's saying here, he says, if the dead are not raised, then let us just live for, for this here. Really, as, as Paul continues in verse 33, which is our third point, he says here, as the third point is the resurrection gives us purpose to live. He says here, he says, do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Do not be led astray by lies. And as Paul, as he comes as he makes a sharp correction that we have here that do not go astray. Do not slack. Why? Because there is a resurrection. Do not be deceived. He says here that, that, that Paul corrects the Corinthian thinking about the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul comes off strong just because of the weight of the subject and what it implies if there is no resurrection. As he says here, bad company ruins good morals. And as in verse 12 it says, in chapter 15 it says, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There were some who said that there is no resurrection of the dead. One of the problems that they had, and really what happened, was that, that bad company, it corrupts good character. This is bad association, denied the resurrection, and it ends up decaying their lifestyle and their thinking. That Paul is saying, divorce yourself from the men who are teaching heresy and denying the core doctrine of the resurrection. Stop listening to them because they are ruining you. They are spreading false beliefs about who Christ is. He's saying, get rid of the unscriptural teachings. And in 34, he says, wake up from your, from your drunken stupor. He says, shake yourself from sleep. Wake up. He said, Paul is sounding the alarm to their conscience. Because when you're asleep, you're not diligent. You're not aware. that They should be on, on, on caution. They should be on duty. They should be on watch. Stop being passive. Be active. That the, the Corinthians were intoxicated by a carelessness. What should they wake up to? It says to what is righteous or what is right. There's other translations that say, awake to righteousness and sin not. Become righteously sober-minded and stop sinning. Or think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. Really, this indicates that some were not living righteously in, in the reality of the resurrection. There must be no contradiction between what we believe and how we behave. Paul knows that right thinking leads to right living. That our belief about the resurrection, it should translate into our lives of godly living. That they must guard their minds with the truth or else they will be impacted, impacted negatively. Really, as the, the resurrection, as it sanctifies us, it purifies us and exhorts us to holy living. And then he says, do not go on sinning. He says, wake up and do not go on sinning. And really, as this suggests that some were living in the pattern of sin, 
and that they must cease to, that they must renounce and forsake every evil way. And really, he's not saying that they must live a perfect life, but what he is saying, he says, stop living and practicing sin. He says, stop justifying. Don't excuse it. He's saying that you can't live in a rebellious state. That a disbelief in the resurrection leads to a non-righteous life. It says in 34, for some have no knowledge of God. He says, I say this to your shame. I mean, Paul comes on them hard. And it's always with the intention of building them up. That he's pointing to the ignorance that they have of who God is and a failure to know him. That those who reject the resurrection are accused of ignorance. That those who have a disbelief in the resurrection, Paul charges them with the ignorance of the knowledge of God. And he says, I say this to your shame. Now, I want us to reflect upon our three points here. Is that the resurrection gives us boldness to risk. The resurrection gives us motivation to sacrifice. The resurrection gives us purpose to live. Now, our growth in Christ will only exceed to the knowledge of God. That we must challenge ourselves and see, where am I? Where is my heart? Do I live in this present reality that Christ really rose? Do I live as though Christ really rose from that grave? Because in fact, if Christ really did rise, then everything about our lives would be different. Nothing would be the same that it would move us to risk. It would move us to sacrifice, to give ourselves, and move us to live righteous lives in response to what Christ has done for us. That we must look to Christ because Christ is our only hope and there's no one ounce of saving grace outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the eternal one, the one who descended from from heaven, who lived a perfect life, who went upon that cross, who had a crown of thorns upon his head, who had blood dripping over his face. To know that what Christ has done and that he really did rise, that should exhort us to live a light for him in response to what Jesus has accomplished for believers. That we stand forgiven because of the resurrection and what Christ has done. That we have new life because of Christ. That there is no salvation outside of Christ. That we look to him who is the perfect one. The victorious one, the one who reigns and rules over all. That this is the Christ that we look to. That he gave his life for you and I. Let us think about that just for a moment. That he gave his very life for you personally. And how will you and I live in response to that giving? Will we not hold our life valuable and say, Lord, here am I. Are we willing to risk whatever the cost may be? Are we willing to put ourselves at risk for the gospel's sake? That we may find ourselves here complacent and comfortable in our Christian walk. And the resurrection, it awakens us and it gives us life to say, I will give it all because I have this life to come of abundance of joy, that this is not the end to it. That you may be here and you may be discouraged, depressed, downcast, 
and suffering. It may be miserable for you, but the hope of the resurrection gives you hope in your present situation because Jesus lives. That I'm willing to suffer, I'm willing to go through everything. Why? Because of the hope of the glory that is to be revealed. That in my present circumstance, I will rejoice in God and know it is well with me. Because this is not the end of your story and my story. That really, as our death is only the beginning of something much more beautiful. Let us be reminded of this beautiful truth here. And what the resurrection means for you and I. The implications the implications it has for you today in this moment. Amen.